thank you for the invitation. It's really great to be here. I said to Roger on the way over, it's really nice not to talk about working memory training, which is all anyone has wanted to hear about for about the last 18 months. So it's really nice to talk about something different. And as I was putting the talk together, um, it's quite hard, tricky to put together because it's different to the kind of talk that I would normally like to give, which is about particular mechanisms and then looking at those using different techniques or different populations. And this is really a talk about one, or about our attempt to run and collect what for us is a big data set. There's about 500 kids in at the moment. It'll be about 700 by the time we're finished. And it's specifically about studying developmental disorders, so children who are developing atypically. And whether or not big data can provide not just big sample sizes and big statistical power, but theoretically different ways of thinking about what a developmental disorder is. Um, and I thought that I would just start, before doing much of an introduction about study, by telling you about an example of a study that we've run on a developmental disorder. And it, in my program, we're really interested in attention and working memory, and disorders of attention and disorders of working memory. And, of course, the classic example of a disorder is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which I'm sure you've all heard of. So we thought that we would embark on a study looking at the neural correlates of ADHD. And so we went to our friendly clinician, and they referred us, uh, or they gave us the details of a group of 43 children with ADHD. And we had some exclusion criteria, so the children couldn't have any comorbid diagnoses. We didn't want any children with ASD-like symptoms or anything else. We wanted very pure ADHD kids. And they had to have IQ within the normal range, and we wanted them to be off medication. We then wound up with a testing sample, so, so 14 of our children were, so, um, were not excluded and were in the right age range. We then used another data set that we had to trawl through and find 14 typically developing children who didn't have any diagnoses, but they were matched on age, gender and IQ with our ADHD group. And then we stuck them in the scan, we went with the cognitive, uh, the CBU's Cognition Brain Sciences Unit standard scanning protocol, which we use on various different studies. So we had a T1 weighted, we had DTI, and we had a, a short resting state scan as well. Then we used a technique which we've used a lot, which is um, a technique for analyzing DTI data using uh, fractional anisotropy called TBSS, or Track Based Spatial Statistics. So it's a whole brain measure, it's a whole brain method. Uh, which relies on you overlaying or warping all of the children into a common skeleton template so that you can do voxel-wise comparisons across, across your children. And when we did that, we found this uh, kind of tract in the right inferior frontal area, which I've highlighted there with a, a, a red circle. And so that, presumably, is the neural correlate of attention problems. And I suspect that everyone's probably already worked out that this is an entirely fabricated uh, study. This isn't a study we ran at all, but we have run studies like this. And studies, anyone who studies developmental disorders has run studies like this. We have run many of them. Um, and this is by no means a criticism of them, because they're an incredibly powerful way of making progress. But I think it's also important to be aware of the limitations of that kind of study and of the kind of assumptions we make when we're running a study with that classic canonical case control design, relatively small sample sizes. What assumptions are we making? And are there ways that we can use a different technique and a different approach to complement um, to complement the kind of traditional way of doing things? So just to kind of tease out one potential potential issue is who we are studying. Okay, so are these the only children with attention problems that we should be studying? So I'm sure everyone's aware that diagnostic frameworks can be very inconsistently applied. That happens even in the UK. So in Cambridgeshire, they stopped dishing out ADHD diagnoses because they ran out of cash. So there's a very large uh, waiting list of children with very strong ADHD-like symptoms built up because none of these children have a diagnosis, so they wouldn't be in our study. But um, the diagnostic frameworks are inconsistently applied, applied even within the same country, let alone internationally. If you look at ADHD prevalence, you find that it varies massively across countries. Is that because the US has a massive problem with ADHD, or is that because the diagnostic criteria and frameworks are applied differently? Very probably. So the other thing, anyone who studied 
developmental disorders, as we were saying over lunch, will know that comorbidity rates are exceptionally high. Comorbidity is the rule, not the exception. So by screening children out that don't have alternative diagnoses in, in addition to an ADHD diagnosis, means that you are massively, potentially massively skewing your sample to very particular children. And the kinds of attention problems that are actually observed in the wild are not typically represented in your sample. So the diagnoses can have low specificity, so there can be very high symptom variability across children with apparently the same diagnosis. And they can also have low sensitivity, so they can have a very high symptom overlap with children who have different or no diagnoses. And so constraining your research design by a, a, by a diagnostic framework, is a, it can be limiting. And it's important to think whether there are different ways of doing it. So we, over the last, oh, we've probably been going about 18 months to two years now, have been running a study which we have called CALM. It stands for the Center for Attention, Learning, and Memory. Primarily went for CALM because it makes for a great acronym, although anyone who has done any of the data collection in CALM will know that it's anything but. Um, and really, the ethos is to try and study developmental disorders in a fundamentally different way. So how does recruitment work? Well, the children are referred to as and they can be referred to as by any professional in working in children's services. And that includes both educational and clinical routes. And they're referred, in a very generic way, on the basis of ongoing problems in attention, memory, and or learning. It's meant to be an intentionally broad catch. Pretty much any children, a child who has fallen behind in cognitive terms can be referred. And the exclusion criteria are very minimal, so if they have a, a known or diagnosed genetic condition, then that is an exclusion criteria. If they have a known um, sensory problem, so if they're blind, for example, then that is an exclusion criteria. But anything which we think firmly is a, a, a cognitive problem in childhood can be referred. We receive the referrals, our team then make contact with the families, and they're invited to come and visit the CBU. We have a special kind of purpose, it's not purpose built, it was built already, but it's been refurbed for testing kids. We have a three hour battery of cognitive assessments. So that includes measures of phonological processing, short term and working memory, as you'd expect, uh, nonverbal reasoning, vocabulary, literacy, numeracy, long term memory, processing speed, executive functions and attention. And in all of those domains, we tried to choose what we thought were kind of the the industry standard, kind of gold standard measures that were widely used in the literature and that we had age standardized norms for those kids. Because as something we'll, we'll come on to over and over again is, is whether you should recruit controls as well. Whilst the parents are captive, we also um, make them do a series of questions. So the questionnaire, so they do the strength and difficulties questionnaire. The brief, which is the behavioral rating inventory for executive functions. You might want to know that Connors. Connors is a, a kind of industry standard um, tool used by practitioners, including clinicians, um, especially for ADHD, I guess, but inattention like symptoms. CCC2 by your very own Dorothy Bishop is a communication checklist, children's communication checklist. Uh, and we've recently introduced some child mental health assessments for anxiety and depression, and those are completed by both child and parent. Those are also age standardized. Kids <clears throat> are also then invited to go in the scanner. Um, uptake of that is pretty good, but of course it, there's a time lag. Um, so the N for the MRI isn't as big as it is for the cognitive assessments. They do ask a kind of standard protocol that we have of structural and resting state scanning. That's the same as for the CAMCAM project that Roger mentioned earlier. Um, the idea is eventually we could do a sort of pan development analysis. We also are doing a very good job at harvesting large amounts of spit. Uh, so all the children contribute um, saliva, which we're banking. We don't yet know what we will do with it, but it seems like we might kick ourselves if we didn't collect it now. So what are the outputs? So the first thing that goes out is a report to the referrer. So the incentive for them is that we do a kind of standard report which characterizes the, that child's profile. Um, relative to the normative sample for each assessment using the cognitive and questionnaire data. And it is for the professional then to use that report as they will to try and support the child. Um, so we are not clinicians. 
and we make that very clear at the outset, and we don't offer clinical or professional advice in that capacity, but we provide the report. If there are issues of interpreting the report, then we can um, give assistance there, um, but otherwise we let the referrers know we, the report, and then we inform the parents directly that the referrers have their child's report and to get in touch with them if they're interested. Uh, this naturally generates a relatively large data set where you can address some questions, and I'm going to give you some examples of questions that researchers are currently using the data for. And it also provides a really great stage two database, so you can now recruit children from children that have been referred for subsequent studies. So you could go through and say, well, I want children with a particular cognitive profile, not a diagnostic group necessarily, but a particular cognitive profile for my subsequent study. Like I want poor learners, or I want children with phonological deficits. Um, and then we can make contact with them and invite them to come back for a new study. Does that make sense, the general ethos and structure of the study? Okay, <clears throat> so so far, this is when I started the talk, which is about two or three weeks ago. We're now closing in on the 500 mark. So we've been collecting data since the end of 2015, I think. So, points of interest. So where do the kids come from? Very early on, we realized that the people who were referring lots of kids were SENCO, so Special Educational Needs Coordinators. It might be because they are the most desperate in terms of resources for assessments. So there's not much resource for doing ed psych assessments, um, and they can refer children to us for free. So we had a large number of referrals, but you'll see that there are other routes as well. For instance, 81 referrals from pediatricians, 30 from clinical psychologists. These are the kind of diagnoses that the kids come with, and you can see that there's a, these are the percentages of kids with those diagnoses. If you do your math quick, you'll realize this adds up to more than 100%, and that's because, of course, kids can have more than one diagnosis. One thing to notice is that about two-thirds of the sample don't come with any particular diagnosis. And I think that may be what you'd expect, given that there are quite a large chunk of kids that are referred from their schools directly. So they wouldn't normally reach the attention of clinicians. But you can see there's a pretty hefty group of kids with ADHD diagnoses. Um, possible ADHD, you see there's another 8%. These, these are kids on the waiting list to see a clinician about having ADHD. So they, they probably will meet the diagnostic criteria, because to get that far, you have to be pretty severe. Um, rates of autism or ASD are a little bit lower. But this gives you an idea of the kind of kids that we're seeing. And we're now currently trying to really push for referrals from um, speech and language therapists and more clinical routes to make sure that we, we're worrying that, we just worried that we were somehow biased towards these kids and that might influence the kind of children that we're recruiting. Um, but these are the kids that we've seen so far. First question you might ask is really, how poor at learning are they? Uh, these are um, standardized literacy and numeracy measures, so you can see the spread of performance. So 100 is exactly where you would expect the kids to be. These are the standard deviations either side. You, so you can see that on average the kids in the CALM sample are about a standard deviation below the age expected mean. One other way of doing this is a, a plot that Sue Gallico made. You can express the profile of the children as a whole in terms of standard scores, in terms of a standard deviation. So minus one is a standard deviation below the population mean. So you can see the kids have been referred on the basis of learning problems, and indeed they do all have, well, they don't all, but the sample as a whole has a pretty strong learning problem. And you can see that on the various different kinds of cognitive measures, so phonological processing measures, memory measures, what we've kind of called fluid intelligence measures, you can see that they're around a half to two-thirds of a standard deviation below what you would expect for their age. Other way of you can think about carving the data up is looking at deficits, so more than the standard deviation below the mean. And you can start to look at the proportions of kids that fall into different bins. So, for example, it's very rare to have a deficit in vocabulary on its own. It's, very, it's actually pretty rare to have a deficit in reading on its own. It's not very rare to have a deficit in maths, I would say, which is quite interesting. I don't think I've necessarily predicted that. But what you can also see is that it's quite common to have deficits in maths and other things. And interestingly, it's been pretty consistent the whole way through, is that about a quarter of the children don't have any problems as far as we can tell. So they are at age-expected levels on all of our learning measures, and they're 
pretty much bang on what you would expect on all of the cognitive measures as well. Which in a way might be a, a problem in your rec re recruiting some kids who are entirely typical, but actually that's quite nice because one thing you might want to do at some point is, is see if that if, is contrast performance with children who are typically developing and having a group who have been referred in an identical way but who are, as far as we can tell, entirely age typical might be quite useful. So that's the composition of the CALM sample so far. You can do so many different things with the data. This is just one example of one rough and ready thing that we did early on, which is just, you can start to kind of carve it up in terms of different groups. So the red line is showing you kids who have deficits in vocabulary, reading, and maths. And the red line is showing you the kids who have just deficits in vocabulary and maths. It's quite a nice example, and you can see there's one very stark difference, which is um, rapid naming, which is a measure from the FAB, the Phonological Awareness Battery. And basically, if kids are within the normal range on the FAB, then they're most, they're in, even though they have deficits pretty much everywhere else, then they're likely to be okay at reading. They like to read in the normal range. If you've got a deficit on that as well, then you'll probably be in the deficit group on everything else. So that's just one way that you can use the data um, to pull out particular groups. There I've, having said that's not what you ought to do. Uh, so what I'm going to try and give you are some examples of things that you can do with the data. And later this year, the data will all be available. And so you can access them yourselves and, and you can answer your questions. So having cogn common cognitive and behavioral measures across all these children enables us to explore one, dimensions of disorder rather than categories. So rather than thinking about particular groups, are there cross-cutting dimensions that go right across traditional diagnostic boundaries, but are there meaningful and important dimensions in which children with developmental problems differ? You can look at relationships between symptom dimensions that cut across traditional groups, kind of what I've said. So for example, if you study attention and working memory measures, you wouldn't traditionally take language and communication measures as well, and vice versa. If you study language and communication, you might include one working memory measure or one attention measure. And so we traditionally study these things in isolation because of our particular interests. But a neat thing about a data set like this is that you can explore how those things might overlap. You can look at the potential value of data-driven subgrouping. So can we derive different groups, not using kind of a priori diagnostic frameworks, but using different sorts of machine learning approaches to see what subgroups exist within the data set. And finally, when you've done that, you can think about testing the, uh, the validity of the traditional diagnostic boundaries and frameworks that you have. So just to give you some examples. So this is um, a structural equation model, and much the same way as Roger has shown. This isn't produced by me, but by Sue Gavakol. <coughs> it's quite amazing that given the heterogeneity in the kids that we have seen, the, 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 the best fitting underlying model is actually remarkably simple. Um, so there are a few extra measures that we need to add in, um, but I don't think that will change the model radically. So what Sue first did was fix, was establish this bit with an exploratory analysis. So she used these direct measures to infer that we had these two underlying factors. So one is a sort of uh, spatial short-term working memory and matrix reasoning factor, which she's labeled executive here. And there's a more phonological based underlying factor because all of these measures have in common they're somehow based on phonological representation so they're things like phonological awareness verbal short-term and working memory you can see that those two underlying dimensions are highly correlated so you might think aren't they just the same thing well they're not if you try and force it into one factor then the model doesn't fit nearly so well <clears throat> and then these underlying latent constructs are predictive of these different aspects of learning outcomes. So maths, vocabulary, we've put story recall over here because we think that it's essentially a language measure and reading. <clears throat> and you can then add in additional behavioral outcomes. So these are measures taken from the brief, looking at things like inattentive, inattentive performance, uh, inattentive behavior, and executive behavior, and they're significantly related to these underlying factors. So one thing that we're quite surprised at is that even though the kind of 400 and odd kids that went into this come from very different sources with apparently very different deficits, the overall pattern or underlying set of factors that explains the data exceptionally well is actually a really simple 
model with really two main underlying factors. Um, as Sue said when she showed this to us, she said, on a bad day, I do worry that we've just reinvented IQ. Um, but I think that it's, it's important to think about what makes up these factors and how they map onto these different learning outcomes. So the, the second example I was going to give you is an analysis that was conducted by Erin Hawkins, who's a postdoc in my lab, and Joni Holmes, who's a, a senior scientist at the unit. And we, got, we, were made, we were contacted by a journal running a special issue on the overlap between language disorders or language problems and attention problems. And we wouldn't normally have ever collected a data set where we looked at both of those things, but we have the data here, and so we thought, well, that's quite an interesting question to ask about the overlap between these different dimensions. So one of the first things we did was carve the data up into three groups. Children who had a formal diagnosis of ADHD, which are the green bars here, kids who just have very high symptoms of hyperactivity on the basis of the Connors, and, symptoms, and kids who have lower hyperactivity symptoms on the Connors. And you can see their performance on the vocabulary measures, the spelling measures, the reading measures, and alliteration. That's a measure from the phonological awareness battery. So these are different ways of thinking about kind of language or literacy performance. And at this level, it doesn't really distinguish the groups tremendously well. These are the scales from the CCC2, so the Child's Communication Checklist. So you've got measures of structural properties of language here measures of uh, pragmatic uses of language, so things like stereotype language, inappropriate initiations of conversations, use of context. And what you can already start to see is that the groups are somewhat more similar on these structural measures of language. On the right-hand side, you can see that the difference between the groups become more pronounced when it becomes a pragmatic use of language. And a much way of demonstrating that is rather than using these sort of rigid cutoffs in terms of the groupings is to derive underlying factors or dimensions for those uh, different aspects of language and then look at their relationships. And that's exactly what they did. So they used the Connors questionnaire to derive um, one underlying factor using an exploratory factor analysis. They did the same thing um, with their so-called literacy measures. And then they put the CCC2 communication subscales into a factor analysis and that produces two different factors. So one is things like syntax, speech, semantics, which are sort of classic measures of structural language. And one is things like um, stereotype language, inappropriate notation, use of language in social contexts, which we've referred to as factual, which is more of a pragmatic uses of language. And what you can see when you compare those different dimensions is that a child's behavior, in terms of kind of inattentive behavior, is very strongly related to their use of pragmatic language skills and more weakly associated with their use of structural language skills. Whereas if you look at the literacy factor, it's the other way around. So uh, uh, the literacy measures are most, much more closely related to a child's structural language than to their pragmatic uses of language. And that's exactly what you can see if you look at the correlation breakdown. So there's a strong relationship between behavior and pragmatic uses of language and a significantly weaker association um, with their structural uses of language. And so one thing that um, Erin and Joni are now doing and beginning to explore whether there's really one underlying dimension that is being tapped by the, an apparently communication questionnaire and an apparently kind of behavioral inattention questionnaire, um, that there's really one underlying dimension. That's really quite separate from sort of structural uses of communication and language. And this is the kind of analysis that we wouldn't naturally have thought of doing because we wouldn't really collect all of these measures on the same kids. And the final example I was going to give um, is, is on the potential value um, of data-driven subgrouping. So um, this is done by a postdoc in my lab called Joe Battelt, and he used the communication, uh, sorry, the Connors questionnaire, which has six subscales, to uh, apply a technique called community-based clustering. So it's an iterative process, and what it's attempting to do is identify whether there are subgroups of children within the data who's, who are highly correlated with each other and weakly correlated with the other children. And it, it runs iteratively, and it's trying to es essentially um, minimize the variance by applying underlying clusters. And so what you can hopefully see quite clearly is that the end result implies that there are three underlying clusters. So you can see that the, this is on about the first 350-odd kids. You can see there's one group 
where everyone's very closely correlated with each other, but weakly correlated with other kids. There's a second group where the same is true, and there's a third group. This is something called a spring plot, which shows you the same thing, really, that each node corresponds to a child, and the connection corresponds to their the strength of association between them and the other children. So you, the, the stronger the association, the tighter the spring, and it kind of draws them together to form this kind of spatial cluster. And you can see, again, you've got the three groups. If you compare the profiles of the kids in the three groups, you can see some interesting differences. So you can see that there's C1, cluster 1. They're a group of kids who have particularly elevated problems in things like aggression and peer relationships. And underneath here, Joe's done some uh, paired sample t-tests to show that these children are significantly worse on these scales than the other kids. You've got a group of kids called cluster 2. These are kids who don't have any particular behavioral problems, but they do have quite strong learning problems. So their, um, their parents rate them as relatively high on problems with literacy and numeracy and learning in school. Then you have another group of kids, cluster 3. These are kids who don't have much in the way of things like um, aggression and peer relation problems, but they do rate very highly on symptoms of inattention and hyperactivity. So you get these three different groups. And of course, an obvious question to ask is, the kids who actually have a diagnosis of ADHD, which group are they in? And of course, the answer, as you might predict, is that the diagnostic label has no explanatory power in terms of determining where the kids end up. And that's true, actually, of all the major diagnoses that we've been able to collect. So whatever this data-driven subgrouping is, it's orthogonal to the kind of diagnostic label that the children have been given. You might think well, this is all a bit kind of like overfitting of the data. You can compare the groups on measures that you haven't used in the clustering, and you can find very similar differences. I won't go through them all, but these are um, differences on the brief. These are differences on the SDQ, and you can find very similar relationships in those. I'm going to skip on in the interest of time. Okay, <clears throat> so a quick interim summary. So big data does more than just boost statistical power. It allows you to ask questions in a different way. So traditional case control design has dominated our study of developmental disorders, and that's been a really powerful tool. But it has some important limitations. So it overstates the potential purity of symptoms within disorders. It may not be representative of these problems in the wild. It doesn't capture commonalities across disorders. And large data sets with broader recruitment provide a potential alternative. So they might be more representative of children with developmental disorders as they appear to professionals who work with those kids. It allows for a dimensional approach rather than a categorical approach. You can contrast symptoms across apparent disorders. And potentially it uh, gives the possibility of data-driven pro profiling, which is a different way of thinking about disorders. Okay. <clears throat> How am I doing for time? I've been getting half an hour. Okay, okay, okay. So the other thing I was going to raise is is about the neuroimaging methods. So this is a quite this is a technique that we actually already have used in our lab, and we still continue to use it. This idea of looking for voxel overlap across kids. And are these the only, or even the best methods for thinking about brain correlates of developmental disorders? So these methods are reliant on voxel by voxel overlap across children. They don't tell us about widespread, subtle differences that might be just as important. And they don't tell us about differences in, or changes in brain organization. So they really stem, I guess, in a way, from a sort of classic neuropsychological way of thinking about the brain, which is really how we started thinking about brain behavior relationships, which is that this is classic kind of patient HM, which is your sort of canonical case control um, design. The idea that particular brain regions are associated with particular cognitive functions, and when you knock them out, you get an associated cognitive deficit. And Annette Karloff-Smith and many others um, since have told us that this is a very poor model for thinking about developmental disorders. This isn't how developmental disorders work. They emerge over time, and that gradual emergence over developmental time is important for thinking about the kind of brain correlates we might expect. So an alternative way to thinking about it is it's more of like a cascade model. So imagine this marble running down this surface, and these potentially these different channels might differ only by small amounts early on, but these sorts of trajectories can result in very big differences in a later stage of development. And so, for instance, uh, Mark Johnson's um, interactive specialization model 
which talks about how effects might cascade throughout a system and result in bigger changes at the end. And th the problem is with neuroimaging is that even though we've known all about the idea that this is how development works and it's not appropriate to use this model, our methods still, by and large, rely on this kind of assumption of this kind of mapping of um, brain and behavior. So if you just, I've been busy with Photoshop again, um, you can imagine that across 10 of our cases, we've got a kind of largely consistent sort of right inferior frontal kind of difference. But what I've also spent time coloring in is these, uh, these green bits here in the parietal lobe. Now, because I took my time, I made sure that they didn't overlap much. And so if you stick those in a sort of voxel-wise analysis, you'll get nothing, right? None of these will survive significance. But is that really to say that these consistent differences in the parietal lobe across all 10 kids are totally unimportant in the characterization of that disorder? And this, this right hemisphere frontal thing is the, is the real deal. Probably not. So we do it all the time. This is an example um, uh, looking at learning. Pro uh, this is a reading problem. So taking children who have a reading deficit based on a relatively arbitrary cutoff, scanning them, comparing them with reading typical controls, voxel-wise comparison, you get this tiny little tract of difference between the groups. And we infer that this left hemisphere tract within the kind of language system is the neural correlate of reading deficits. And if you do it with maths, then you get one in the parietal lobe instead. But it gives us the impression that Problems in learning are associated with discrete and usually quite small uh, brain differences, almost like the children have a lesion. So an alternative way of doing it is to try and capture a more broad uh, image of the organization of the brain. So this is showing you all potential fibers that we are able to extract with uh, diffusion tensor imaging using FA. And we can simplify that um, to a whole brain model, which is referred to, I'm sure many of you know, um, as a connectome. So in a connectome, nodes are particular cortical regions, and the edges refer to the overall degree of direct con connectivity between those specific nodes. And that connectivity can be structural, so using something like fra um, FA, fractional anisotropy derived from DTI, or they can be functional, so sort of correlations in bold, for example. And you can construct these whole brain um, connectomes. And in the examples I'm going to give, we've used structural connectivity using FA, so it's white matter connections. So if we just zoom in on part of the network, you could imagine that if we have a deficit in one particular tract, then that could kind of cascade over developmental time to reductions in connectivity elsewhere, or alternatively it could be compensated for, so you could imagine that the overall connectivity between this node and this node isn't reduced because there's these additional connections that make up for it. And that, might imp imp that, might, that compensation might impose a relatively minimal reduction in the efficiency of the network, but another sort of compensation might impose a much more substantial reduction in the, in the efficiency of the network. And the really neat thing about connectomes is you can apply um, a mathematical framework called graph theory, which is what Joe has indeed done, to start to quantify these differences in the organizational principles of networks. So, for example, you can use something like path length, which is the shortest distance between nodes in the network. Clustering coefficient, so the extent that nodes cluster together, i.e. are nodes connected neighbors also connected to each other? Do they form one sort of group? Or node degree, simply the number of connections per node. And you can express these measures globally. So and this is an example that I'll tell you more about in a second. So we're looking at a particular behavioral score, and it's relationship between the global clustering coefficient across kids. But you can also then sort of project those back into make, to make regionally specific graph theory measures. Um, so this is showing you the distribution of clustering coefficient across a group of children. So the first example I'm going to tell you about is actually not big data at all, but it's the first time I use the connectome, so it makes a good sense to tell you about it. It's a study called Bingo, which is looking at children with rare genetic conditions. And it's a collaboration between Kate Baker, Gaia, uh, Lucy Raymond in Cambridge, Elise, who's there, um, and Sinead. As part of this behavioral study, so visiting children who have intellectual disability that's um, caused by a specific gene, we visited one group of children who have a genetic mutation in a gene called ZDHHC9. You don't need to know anything about that, other than that it's a recurring cause of intellectual disability. But when Kate visited the children, she found that 
rather than being globally impaired, they had really very profound speech and language problems. And there were enough cases, so we had eight cases, and they all came to the unit. They went through our structural scanning protocol. And we derived whole brain connectomes for uh, ZX89 and their controls. So uh, we really do still do case control designs, in case you wanted. Um, you can see immediately that there are relatively large differences across the cases and the controls. You can express, you can summarize those by showing that the edges, so the, the, the white matter connections are reduced in terms of the kind of subcortically, in terms of the left hemisphere, right hemisphere, and across the hemispheres. And that's true even when you correct for multiple comparisons. And if you apply the graph theory measures, then they differ from the controls in pretty much every regard. But what you can also do is project those differences onto the, onto the surface of the brain. You can explore where the differences lie. And you can see that even though there are these very global differences, there's also some regional specificity to the cases. So these uh, cases who have very profound speech and language problems also have these reduced measures of connectivity in the temporal lobe and in the frontal parietal network. And one very neat thing that Joe then did was to go to the Allen Atlas, which is a publicly available resource which, from which you can derive regional patterns of gene expression. And he could then explore whether there's a systematic relationship between the strength of expression of our gene and different aspects of the connectome. And he found that the clustering coefficient in the connectome was very significantly associated with the overall expression profile of this gene across, um, across different areas in the brain. So it's provided us with a way of starting to think about how different genes might be associated with different patterns of cognitive deficit based upon where in the brain they are most um, predominantly expressed. Okay, so second example is from the CALM sample again. So back to our kind of big data set. Just to remind you, this is sort of the classic way of looking for brain behavior relationships in learning measures. So another way of doing it is to use the CALM data set, and rather than being categorical, use the continuum of the literacy and numeracy schools to see whether there are systematic differences in the connectome across children that predict where in this distribution they sit. And that gives you quite a, a, a radically different picture of the neural correlates of reading and math problems than you would get with the classic case control design. So firstly, the sample size is rather bigger than you would have in those cases, in those examples. Um, but also, using a connectome doesn't rely explicitly on the voxel overlap across cases or across children. So actually, you find that there are very widespread differences or very widespread sets of connections for both reading and maths. Reading and maths. Um, about 5% of connections in the brain, in the whole brain connectome, are significantly associated with differences in literacy and numeracy. <clears throat> and you can see two measures here. So this is clustering coefficient, and this is path length. And they're both significantly associated at a global level with a child's reading and math performance. Uh, yeah, go on. I'm glad to see you do exactly the same thing as in old age and intelligence, just ignore the cerebellum. But we have a good tradition of doing that, but you see, there seem to be some things going on there. Or, or yeah, yeah, they're included in our... So do you, is there any more sophisticated thinking than in old age? But Because in old age, people just ignore the cerebellum. Ooh, I don't think we're ignoring it, I guess... Not you, but I just mean it, it rarely figures in explanatory accounts, even though it's often a figure for the statistical maps. So. Yeah. I don't know what the... There, there is a literature on, on cerebellum and reading problems, for example. Slightly... slightly the, it's an interesting literature. Um, I think that the next question is to think about... So this is emphasising the broad distributed differences that are associated with literacy and numeracy rather than this sort of focal lesion-like approach. But the next question then is to think whether there are particular roles for certain areas. We have some ideas about how we do that, but I might come back to it at the end. That's okay. Um, as anyone knows, in, in Connectomics, you find certain nodes that are really important. They're sometimes referred to as the rich club. So they're nodes that are very highly connected to the rest of the network, sort of like hubs. And we know that from a psychiatry literature that these hubs are really important. So very many different types of psychiatric disorders converge on a kind of optimal brain organization with these densely interconnected hubs um, that provide a kind of basis for widespread communication within the brain. And it turns out the same is true with literacy and numeracy. 
So if you start to manipulate the models and you knock out the hub nodes, you find that disproportionately reduces the um, kind of clustering coefficient and the path length, so the efficiency of the network gets gradually worse relative to if you start to drop out random nodes or peripheral nodes. But importantly, the relationships between the connectome measures and literacy and numeracy also drop disproportionately when you start to attack the blue nodes, the, the rich club. And that's what you can see in these plots here in terms of the clustering coefficient relationships with, with maths and with reading and the path length measures with maths and with reading. And you might think, well, surely you don't see all of these differences with the classic design. Well, we can use the data set to, to carve data up and do the classic design. So these are people with a, a maths more than a standard deviation below the population mean versus age typical maths. And down here, people with reading deficits, so reading scores more than the standard deviation below the population mean versus typical readers. And there are no differences that survive for multiple comparisons. So a method that relies on the voxel overlap across the, across the kids just doesn't work. It doesn't capture the differences. Final example, and I'm done. We tried the ConnectM approach also with these three groupings that we got from the um, data-driven subgrouping from the Connors questionnaire. So remember, you've got the kids with the conduct-like problems, the poor learners, and the inattentive hyperactive kids. And uh, what Joe did is he simplified the connectomes by basically putting them through a principal component analysis. And you find out that there are particular networks whose, whose uh, graph theory properties all co-vary together. And you find that some of these components are very strong predictors of which group children end up in. So just to give you two nice examples. So this particular network here, these uh, kind of frontal regions and these visual areas, kids who fall into the inattentive hyperactive subgroup have reduced connectivity in these areas. And the other nice example is this one here, um, in, in incorporating kind of um, ACC, part of the temporal lobe, and also part of the frontal uh, lobe. Kids who have this inattentive, uh, sorry, in the kids who have the kind of conduct-like problems differ significantly from the kids with the standard kind of learning problems. And so we're now in the process of seeing whether we can map these distributions onto the Allen Atlas to look and see whether there are any genes that distinguish these different kinds of um, ex gene expression profiles that distinguish these different components to start to think about how genetics might relate to these different groupings. And again, we tried to do it with the traditional TBSS approach, and these pictures all look really pretty, but none of these differences survive multiple comparisons corrections, which I think highlights again the value of a connectome-like approach. So large data sets also provide opportunities for new types of brain imaging analysis. So we found that connectome approaches can be very valuable for studying developmental disorders because they don't rely on the voxel overlap across cases. They can capture subtle distributed differences, which might be very important for disorders. They can provide metrics of organization, which traditional measures can't. And in our experience, very practically, they reduce the massive multiple comparisons problem. And we're hoping that over longitudinal time, we can capture compensating or cascading effects um, within these models. So just very quickly to wrap up, where next for CALM? So we've currently got about eight projects ongoing using the CALM data as it currently exists. So later this year, the first 500 data sets will be made available to the wider research community. So anyone can access them. That includes the cognitive questionnaire and neuroimaging data. Later this year, we start recalling the children for a three-year longitudinal follow-up. Uh, we have some additional measures of health outcomes. And it's already forming a really great database for follow-up studies on things like for things like interventions like attention training, medication effects for kids who have been medicated, um, and sleep consolidation effects in poor learners. Final slide I thought might be quite useful is to think about practical problems in setting up a big data set. Firstly, my advice would be cast your net wide in terms of measures, so you want breadth. Try and use reliable standardized measures that you have confidence in. Um, We've had some experiences there. Uh, try and harmonize scanning sequences with other cohorts. So we have the same scanning sequences as CAMCAN, for example, so that we can combine across cohorts if we want. Ethics is tricky. Make sure that you include data sharing in info and consent forms. So we actually got consent for it, um, permission for the study oh, quite a long time ago. And the standard NRES, NHS ethics consent forms all included kind of clauses about, you know, I understand that only the research team will see my data. Of course, in the interim, 
we've all become very open-minded about sharing of data, rightly so, but the problem is that most of these kids were consented with the old ethics form. So we're going to have to get around that um, in order to make the data available, which we're working on. Establish a management team that includes parents and practitioners. Engage your referrers regularly. So we regularly have practitioner workshops to keep all of the referrers engaged, to keep them referring kids. Remember that you're not clinicians, and you'll have to remind people of that on a daily basis. Uh, make sure you have a robust procedure for reporting incidental findings in neuroimaging data. So having done an awful lot of neuroimaging studies, never found an incidental finding of any kind. And as soon as you get kids referred to you because they have cognitive problems, you'll find that your incidental findings rate will leap quite massively. And so you have, make sure you have a robust and well-oiled procedure for how you get those scans, for instance, down to pediatric neurology, which isn't as straightforward as you would imagine. And make sure that you have a robust safeguarding procedure. So you will find that you start recruiting kids that you wouldn't normally recruit to a standard kind of experimental psychology study because they're sent to you by family workers, by people in schools, and it's really important you have a proper safeguarding kind of flagging and referral procedure set up in advance, which we were very grateful for. I should think by thanking, uh, finish by thanking the rest of my group who have all taken part in collecting data for CALM, but it's much wider than that, so Roger's now also involved, but um, Sue's program is involved, as is Tom's, and in a way, actually, it's an incredibly cheap study to run, so it just has one dedicated research assistant who coordinates all of the referrals, and then everybody pitches in with the testing sort of half a day a week to do the testing. And if you're interested in finding out more, then there's now a Twitter account for the study, um, so you can find out more. And that is it. <laughs>